let's open our Bibles to the book of Daniel. Uh, chapter 2 is where we're going to read. And if you're wondering where it is, uh, if you don't have tabs, you just go to the middle. That's always go to the middle, Psalms, and go to the right. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. And you find it there. But Daniel chapter 2. Um, also, I want you to know uh, that we are experimenting on you this morning. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, at, on Sunday nights, I always use this board. And it's a completely, I guess, different service. Uh, and in fact, someone told a dear friend of mine uh, this week, they said, oh, they said, I don't get a thing out of Sunday morning, but I love Sunday night. And uh, my friend said, what do you think of that? I said, well, they had one nice thing to say. Uh, but, uh, and I, I thought the only difference between Sunday morning, I mean, I'm in both services, same building, it's the board. They like the board. So I thought if we just put it up on the stage, they'd be happy. Uh, I'm teasing. I'm just, we can't do this all the time. When you get all the risers and the choir and the orchestra and everything in between, it wouldn't work. But this morning lends itself that way because I'd like to share with you Maybe something, many of you in western Michigan were brought up in covenantal theological circles. And you think that, that Bible prophecy is just something that, you know, people disagree on and it doesn't really make a lot of difference. I would like to share with you maybe my personal testimony, how I personally, remember I grew up in Michigan too, how I personally came to the conviction that what I'm going to share with you this morning is actually what Jesus believed. And it's what he taught. And I think that we need to lessen the number of things we say, oh, it doesn't matter. This, this matters how you see the whole Bible. So, so let me share what I mean. The coming of the promised and amazing global peacemaker. Now, someone immediately uh, will say, oh, we were just in Revelation 6 endlessly. What happened? This is the same guy that we're looking at in chapter 6, verse 2. That's that's the problem of the book of Revelation. Um, another person, I hear from people all the time. By the way, I do read and listen and, and everything. And people talk about me around here. They think I've lost my hearing. I haven't. I heard someone talking about me. I was walking right behind him. I finally said, you know, I can hear what you're saying. But uh, someone said, you know, we're not making any progress in Revelation. And I said to them, I said, did you know the goal is not, it's so American that we want to get somewhere. I mean, you know, drive as fast as you can. Then when we get there, we say, where else are we supposed to go? Instead of thinking about why are we going there? Do you know what the Bible says in John 17, 17? It says every time we gather as a body of Christ, God wants to sanctify us by his truth. His word is truth. Did you know we could meet until the Lord returns in Matthew or Revelation or Hebrews or Jude or Revelation 6, 2. And if we come with ears to hear and we hear the word of God, he'll be sanctifying us. And that is his goal. His goal is not to hurry through and get somewhere. His goal is to conquer more and more of our lives. So in Revelation 6, we're looking at that white horse, and the white horse is the, is the onset of the spirit of Antichrist into the world. Antichrist is not just a, an influence, 1 John 2.18 says, it's also a person. And I'd like to introduce you to the person Jesus describes as the central point of what all of the tribulation is stemming from. It's this Antichrist. So, Revelation 2, I mean uh, Daniel chapter 2. Now, God makes understanding Bible prophecy very simple. Now, I'm not sure I do. I mean, after first service, a dear friend of mine said, I got mixed up somewhere between 69 and 70 weeks. And I said, I'll clarify that second service. So, but this reminds me, Bible prophecy reminds me of when Bonnie and I had eight little ones and it was hot, muggy summers and we were living in this little place and it was, you know, August and, and everybody was red-faced and dad wouldn't run the air conditioning because the last month I ran it, it would cost $500. So I said, I'm not turning that thing on again. Open the windows. And so we were going through air-conditioned Sam's. You ever go through, you ever gone somewhere because it's air-conditioned? We were walking through Sam's. And all of a sudden, we came on one of those boxes. Have you ever seen them? Has that giant pool, and the family is all smiling. The water is crystal clear, and it looks just like a resort. And, and so we looked at the price tag, and it looked like it was affordable. And so 
I picked up the box and put it in the cart. That should have been my first warning. How could a pool that big fit in that little tiny box? I didn't even think of that. And so everyone was excited and all of us were crowded in the car. And we got home and I took out a knife and I cut it open. And I dumped it out. 1,200 pieces. And, and copious instructions written in German and French and Russian and Urdu. You know, not very much in English. But all that to say it was a very complex to get a 30 or 20, however big it was, pool into that little tiny box meant it was very complex. Sometimes, many people dump out the verses, and they have so many verses on prophecy, it just doesn't make sense. And so what they do is, kind of what I felt like doing, put it all back in the box, and I would have, except it didn't fit. Once you dumped it out, it would not go back in that box to take it back. And so, instead of just saying, we can't understand this, let me take you on a little journey through Jesus explaining to us how to make the complex, how to make the, the most difficult parts of the Bible simple. And so we'll do that this way. In uh, Daniel chapter 2, what Jesus says is this. Jesus tells us, and he doesn't say it here because he didn't write Daniel, although he inspired it. He says in Matthew 24, that Daniel the prophet saw someone in a certain place and that person he saw marks what is going to be the most horrific era, seven years in human history. And that period is known in the Bible as the seven-year tribulation. And what I'm going to show you this morning from Daniel 2 and onward to 7 and to 9 is how come we're dispensationalists? That means that we see a different plan God has for us as a church than he has for Israel. That's the number one thing. If you understand Calvary Bible Church's interpretation of the scriptures, it's this. God has a very clear and voluminous plan for the church. It's all filling the New Testament epistles. God has an equally clear and voluminous plan for Israel, and it fills the Bible from cover to cover, including the epistles. And they're totally distinct plans for two groups that finally merge in heaven, but not before. God's plan for Israel, very clearly, is described here. Let, let me explain it to you. As we open to Daniel 2, note with me how simple God makes understanding the future. First of all, God sends us a picture that describes the history of the world. Now, I love it when someone includes a picture. Uh, with my little pool, I was so glad that there was this little picture that I finally could see how you put together each little part. Well, here's the picture. The picture is that Daniel who, by the way, lived from 620 to 530 B.C. You say, why does that matter? Most people don't like history. Do you know why that matters? Daniel lived fully in the 6th century B.C. The people he describes, their lives and the events that he describes take place in the 4th century, the 3rd century, the 2nd century, and the 1st century and into present times. He saw that 600 BC, what was happening in detail in the future. Daniel talks about Alexander the Great. He talks about Alexander the Great's empire dividing into four parts. If you know anything about history, Alexander had five generals that fought, but only four divided the empire. Everything God's word says happens, just like he said. Well, the... the message that the Lord is giving us is that there are four empires that come before Jesus Christ returns. And what Jesus says is, and, and what's the nice thing, those of you that, are, that aren't here on Sunday morning don't realize the nice thing, I can write on this thing, the, the emperor of the final empire, which is Rome, by the way, happens to be the one who is called the Antichrist. And that is what is so significant you're going to see this morning. If you've ever heard about all this Bible prophecy and how do they get it, I'm going to show you how Jesus Christ in his longest sermon on prophetic things, which is Matthew 24 and 25, which I'll allude to this morning, only quotes by name from Daniel and what we're going to read this morning. Well, Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 31, and if you're there... What Jesus tells us, and, and we'll read it, but I'll tell you in advance, the Antichrist is going to be the worst human being that's ever lived. Now, you may know some awful people. 
I was telling first service, there used to be a real horrible person living in Chicago. His name was Jeffrey Dahmer. I mean, he hated people. He killed people. He dismembered people. He froze them and put them in his refrigerator, and he <laughs> ate them. That's a horrible person. The Antichrist is the most horrible human that will ever live. When Jesus describes him, he says, think about this man who God has given so many names in the Bible. He's called the man of sin. He's called the son of perdition. He's called the beast. He's called the lawless one. He's called the Antichrist. But of all who have ever hated good, hated God, and hated Christians, the Antichrist is the superlative of all of them. If you could take a blender and take the worst persecutors that have ever lived, the, the most horrific deceivers, the most malignant terrorists, and put them in the blender, blend them up, and then stew it down to the essence, do you know what would pop out of your blender? The worst human that will ever live, the Antichrist. And Jesus points at him as he talks about him, and he says, when this man comes, he will pulsate with the power of demons. Do you know what pulsating with the power of demons means? In Mark chapter 5, Jesus meets and, and shares the gospel with a demonized man, and the Bible says that that man was, groups of people would, would wrestle him down, they would hold his hand out, they would put iron shackles, you know, with a hammer and, and nailing them, you know, pinning the pin in and beating them shut, and they'd put chains on him because he was so horrible, and this man could reach onto the iron and snap it with his hands and break the chains. Now, can humans do that? No. That's pulsating with the power of demons. And the Antichrist is going to pulsate with the power of demons. And the flow of the evil desires of Satan will fill him so much that it comes to the point, and you all know this, you've all heard the 666 thing. That isn't a joke. This worst human ever comes to the point that he can track every transaction going on by every one of the seven plus billion people on the earth. And if you have not gotten his signature on your life, the 666, you can't buy or sell. No barter, no cash. You can't operate without him. Now that's what's coming. You say, how will that happen? Well, what's happened this past week? We just found out our government intercepts, takes a picture of every letter that you've ever mailed for the last 10 years. They have a picture of the front and back and the postmark, and they know where you mailed it from. That's our government. I mean, every cell phone, every email, every chat, everything is in Utah by the trillions and this genius and in, in Palo Alto or somewhere made an algorithm where they can find any sequence within all those records that they have for the last 12 years on everybody in America. They can find anything they want instantly. Amazing. But I, I, I don't care. They can do that all they want. Put the gospel in all the time. Have that really ramp up their, their uh, database. But, but you know what it means? We're getting to the point of what the Bible talks about. I mean, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 200 years ago, if you'd have said one person this malignant person can stop anybody anywhere in the world from buying and selling, and they will die without him. They'd go, ah, I'll just go to the Alps. You know, I'll go down in the Amazon. I'll, I'll you know, go to the center, you know, Goa in India. You won't go anywhere. Because the machinery for what the Bible talks about is falling in place around us. Well, chapter 2 Jesus not only says he's the worst human, he affirms, Jesus affirms the reliability of the guy we're going to read. So you have Daniel 2, we're going to read actually verse 31. I decided to back up and read verse 31. So in your Bibles, if you have Daniel 2.31 open before you, let's stand together. You remain standing, I'm going to read all this, and then we're going to pray for the Lord to open our hearts to it. But Daniel chapter 2 and verse 31, and this is what it says. And you, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, this great image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. The image's head 
was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly iron and partly clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like the chaff from the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. There's God's thumbnail of the whole history from 530 B.C. all the way through the end of humanity. And God has seen it, remember? I told you last week, he sees the end from the beginning, and he sees it all at the same time. And he just looked down and said, mm, boom, 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 boom. And that's what God wants us to know. Let's bow before him and ask him to teach us. Father, you've told us in your word that we have an anointing. The instant that we were born again, your spirit anointed the eyes of our understanding. And what that means is every time we open your word, if we invite you to help us understand, to open our eyes to its truth, like we were just singing, if we actually say, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, I want to see you, that you always hear that, that you respond, that you do let us see truth in your word. And that's one of the evidences of being born again this morning, if your word makes sense to us. So all of us together, we pray that you would do what you promised and, and what your desire is for every time we gather as a church. It's not just to go somewhere and get there, but it's to have you sanctify us by your truth. And I pray we'd be sanctified as we learn that your word can be trusted, that you're in control, that you already have the, the ending planned. And all we have to do is follow responding to your spirit within, and we will please you and serve you and look forward to dwelling with you forever. Teach us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're seated, Jesus affirms the reliability of Daniel. You say, what does that mean? Well, I want you to, to notice what, what Daniel says here. Uh, this, this image, and this is the, the next part, he describes this image as having beautiful, beautiful, you know, gold is beautiful, silver is beautiful, bronze looks like gold, and then, of course, all the mighty strength of iron. And, and then he talks about this image, and, and by the way, in first service, one of the dear dads had his smartphone out, and he was punching in, and he got the, he said, the image I should show. I said, I didn't get done with this till age 16. How do you think I'm going to add pictures? But, uh, it, but you can get, you know, there are actual artistic renderings of this, of this Babylonian looking image. And, and what it is, is it's, it's fascinating when it talks about, it has these, these feet of iron and clay. Actually, it says that, that it has 10 toes. Uh, this image is exactly a picture of world history. But before I show you that, let me show you how amazing it is that, that Jesus authenticates Daniel. Turn in your Bibles to, to Matthew 24 now. And uh, I want you to see, and then we'll come back to Daniel. But look at Matthew 24. Jesus is right in the middle of preaching his single longest ever teaching about the end times. I mean, this is the magnum opus of Jesus explaining the future. And, and he, his disciples invite him to share it, and he actually takes two chapters to do it. Matthew actually starts in Matthew 23, 37, and it goes all the way through the end of chapter 25. So we're talking about part of 23, all of 24, and all of 25. That is a long teaching. But did you know the only person the only prophet Jesus cites is, look in verse 15. Therefore, when you see, Matthew 24, 15, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. 
Now just stop there and think about something. Jesus authenticates Daniel. What do I mean by that? Number one, he gives him a strong endorsement. If I'm trying to tell you about something and, and out of all the galaxy of people I could tell you about, I only name one. You know, that's the whole idea of, of commercials, you know, and, and of having, uh, you know, like now what they do is it's a subliminal. You're, you're looking at something and in the background you see something. I mean, it's, it's a very subliminal kind of, it's kind of like the, um, you know, I'm sports challenged and I don't watch really television, but on the computer, my son sent me a link to a Super Bowl ad and I thought, what would I want to watch that for? He says, you'll like it. It was Paul Harvey talking, and a farmer was on the ad, and it never said what the ad was about. All you saw is a black and white picture and a red Dodge Ram. Everywhere, it was a pickup truck in the background. And while Paul Harvey talked, they never mentioned the pickup, but that's all your eyes saw. That's what's going on here. Jesus says, the whole world is ending, and boom, he keeps in the background what Daniel the prophet said. What does that mean? Number one, Daniel is the only Old Testament prophet Jesus calls by name when he talks about the future, and he explains the future in the long and detailed Olivet Discourse, and right there in verse 15, look what he says. When you see the abomination that Daniel talks about standing in the, and what does it say the next part? The holy place? What did the people who heard Jesus say that, his disciples, think about? They were sitting on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives faces toward the west, the city of Jerusalem. Mount of Olives, city of Jerusalem. When you're on the Mount of Olives, all you see is the temple. It's the biggest building in the whole city. And that's what they would have seen in Christ's day. And they were sitting there, and when he said holy place, he was describing the Greek word for the temple. And he says, when you see the person Daniel's talking about standing in the temple, you know bad things are coming. So Jesus authenticates Daniel. Secondly, Jesus said Daniel's a real person. You say, why are you telling us that? Because liberals don't believe it. I'm not talking about political liberals. I'm talking about theological liberals. Do you know what a liberal is? It's someone that dismisses what the Bible says and says, well, it doesn't mean that. For example, I'll just name a name. You ever heard of William Barclay? I mean, he was the Church of England's greatest teacher. William Barclay lived in Scotland. He was the most voluminous theologian writing. I have all of his books. He had a shelf full of books by William Barclay. Do you know what the only problem is with William Barclay? He's, he is liberal, which means he doesn't believe the Bible was inspired. He doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is divine. In fact, he doesn't even think he rose from the dead. In his, his autobi- well, his biography, it wasn't auto, his biography, Uh, Rawlings, who did the biography, quotes him as saying, someday they're going to dig up a tomb in Jerusalem and find the body of Jesus of Nazareth. So he's liberal. He doesn't believe in the resurrection. He doesn't believe in the inspiration of Scripture, that what God says is absolutely true. And he also doesn't believe in the miracles. In fact, one of the funnier things he says when he's commenting He just liked the Bible as literature is what he did, and he liked all the words. But he said, during the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus said, all of you, bow your head and close your eyes. And he backed up, and as he backed up, he backed up to a cave. And his disciples were in the cave, and they had stocked the cave with enough food for 30,000 people, or at least 20. And, And while their heads were bowed, they filled his hands, and he said, amen. And he started going like this and handing out the loaves and the fishes until he fed them all, and no one noticed where it came from. They all thought he created it, and it was a miracle. See, that's a liberal. Did you know that most liberals don't believe Daniel was a historic person? They believe that somebody wrote this after it all happened. Because Daniel chronicles the Babylonian Empire being taken over by the Medo-Persian Empire, being taken over by the Greek Empire, being taken over by the Roman Empire, and that the Roman Empire is going to have two wings, an eastern and a western division. That's the two legs of this image. And the liberals say, no way a guy in the 6th century B.C. could see all the way into the future because we don't believe in miracles or inspiration or that God knows the future. Well, Jesus said he's a real person. He says Daniel is just who the Bible explains him to be. He's a Jew. He's alive in the 6th century B.C. He's in the empire of Babylon. He's in the highest levels in the closing days of the Babylonian Empire and the opening of the Medo-Persian Empire. Jesus said he's the real thing. And the third thing Jesus tells us. You say, how how come you're saying Jesus said all this? Because Peter tells us in 2 Peter that the prophets did not speak on their own. 
That's what 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 says. It was the spirit of Christ that was in them. And Jesus inspired Daniel to write down what Jesus told him the future entailed. And in that, Jesus gives us what I call a road map, a simple map. God gives a map of the future. It's flawlessly accurate. It's a guide for us to understand history, past, present, and future. And when God Almighty, who rules from heaven over the affairs of man, gave to Daniel this snapshot, God's already seen it. And God says, what I told Daniel is what's going to be. So what does God tell Daniel? Well, basically, God tells Daniel there are only four world empires. Now you say, wait a minute, wasn't there an Akkadian empire? Wasn't there an Assyrian empire? Weren't the Chinese? I thought the Chinese were, wasn't there an empire in the Indus Valley? Uh, wasn't there the great, you know, you've all heard of Timbuktu, you know, as if it's, it's a mythical place. No, it's a real place in Africa, and there was a huge African empire laced with gold and ivory and highly civilized in Africa that's not mentioned. Why does God mention that there are only four empires from Daniel to the end of human history. Because God says all of history revolves around his people, his chosen people of promise. Let me show you what I mean. I'll give you a real quick. Now, I don't want to go very long in this. I am watching the clock. But remember, I, am a, I did most of my doctoral work in history. I could talk about history until all of you fell asleep. In fact, you should have seen me speaking at the nursing home. I felt right at home, you know. They're dropping like flies, falling asleep while I was talking. But, um, uh, you know, uh, God only sees four world empires because, number one, the reason Babylon is first is Babylon is the one that took and marked the beginning of what God calls the times of the Gentiles. Up until Babylon, God was fighting for and with Israel. I've told you, if you've ever been on Sunday nights talking about David, that David was the most amazing fighter there ever was. You know, King David, David never lost a battle and he was never wounded in battle, yet he fought sword fights. David won every battle he went in. Some of them, he didn't even have to do anything. God fought the war for him. Like when the, the sound came in the trees and all the Philistines were scared to death and left all their images behind and David burned them up. God said, if you will do what I say, you'll never lose a battle. And the, the Israelites never lost anybody in the conquest of Canaan unless they were disobedient. They could go to war and you could send your sons to Afghanistan and Iraq and nobody got injured or killed. How would you, I mean, war is nice that way if only the bad guys get it. That's what God said, if you will obey me. But Babylon was God's instrument that wiped out Israel because they wouldn't obey him. And when Babylon became an empire, the, what the Bible calls the times of the Gentiles, that's a biblical expression, began. This is when God says, okay, I am stopping my work with my chosen people of promise, the Jews. I am temporarily setting them aside. I'm letting them become the wandering Jews, and they're going to live in every country of the world. They're never going to find a home. They're going to be persecuted. They're going to be troubled. They're going to wake up in the morning, wish it was night. At night, they wish it was morning because they're going to be always pogromed and holocausted until the end. And that's, I just gave you Jewish history, only they put a lot more detail in. That's why this is the first empire, because this is the empire God said starts the times of the Gentiles. And, and because Jerusalem is his focal point of all history, they, after only, what is that, 27, 66 years, that's all they lasted. This, and, and you see the ending of each of these, marks the beginning of the next. The Medo-Persians, now the Babylonians were really an amazing empire, lots of gold, lots of building, and you know, over in Iraq. The Medo-Persians were a huge empire. And they had a million-man army that lost to the Greek empire. Alexander's 20 or 30,000. That would have been a battle to see. You know what Her the Herodotus and other great historians tell us? That when the army of the Medo-Persians, do you know what they wore to battle? Turbans and flowing, wide-legged uh, Persian trousers, cloths. They met Alexander the Great, who was a lightning speed mounted cavalry, 
covered with bronze armor and bronze swords. And these guys had spears, wooden. So they're marching, the million of them, and Alexander just comes through. And, and I mean, you just hold the sword up. You just, I mean, it's easy to go through cloth with brass razor sharp sword and, you know one on each side just mowed him down and Alexander completely wiped out this empire that lasted for about 200 and some years and the Greek empire came and the Greek empire what's fascinating if you know anything about Alexander you know he only lived to be 32 and he died in a dissipated malaria driven drunken orgy but Alexander had five of his generals that fought over the empire but God said only four we're going to get to divide his empire. And you know what? If that fifth one would have won out, the word of God would have been wrong, but God already has seen and decreed. And so Alexander's empire ended in 63. If you remember when Pompey, you all knew Pompey, didn't you? Uh, the Roman victorious general wiped out the, the Greek army. That started what is in history the beginning of the Roman Empire. Now notice this, that the metals get increasingly stronger but cheaper. Gold is most malleable. You can bite it, you know, on uh, westerns. Silver is stronger. Bronze is hard. Iron breaks bronze. Bronze can cut silver. Silver is stronger than gold. But look at these empires, but when did Rome end? See, a lot of people don't pay attention to history. Classic history tells us in 476 AD. No, Rome didn't end. It's just the person sitting on the throne of the king of Rome was a pagan. One of the, you know, remember there were the Vandals and the Huns and the Goths and the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths and the Gothgoths, you know. There were all these pagan Germanic tribes that came down and basically Rome was living, you know, the Romans were just drinking and carrying on and having night and day parties and they killed the king and a, one of the Vandals, one of the pagans became the head of Rome. So Rome didn't end. In fact, remember in the statue that God gives... There are two legs to the statue. And if you remember, this is the Roman Empire. I'm not a good artist. My dad was an artist. I'm not an artist. But this two legs of iron, there was an Eastern Empire and a Western Empire of Rome. And the, the Western, I mean, I mean, Rome, the 476 was the Western, which kind of dissipated in 476, but Constantinople... While Christopher Columbus was working on his plans to come and find us, or the New World, there was still a Roman Empire in Constantinople. Did you know it existed till 1453? And it really never ceased to exist, it just got dispersed. In fact, every piece of the old Roman Empire has had its day running the whole world. The Spanish you know, with all their colonies. The, the Germans with the Holy Roman Empire and, of course, you know, all the... Napoleon with France. They all conquered. The greatest of all was Britain, one of the furthest parts of the Roman Empire. Britain ruled the largest empire the world's ever had. But no one has ever been able to unite the whole thing. And what God says is there's a future time coming and the... Well, I'll show you. Instead of telling you, I will show you because Jesus explains that. So real quickly, some of you think we'll never get out of here. Uh, Daniel 3, or, I mean, Daniel 2 shows the gold and silver and that. If you read Daniel 7, God shows the very same four empires, but it's from his perspective. Have you ever heard a man describe something and a woman describe something? When, when humans describe world empires, they say, oh, they're golden, they're silver, they're shiny brass. God calls them beasts that bite and devour. See, God looks at how you treat people. And, and in chapter 7, God calls all those empires beasts. But look at Daniel 9. That's where I want you to turn. Daniel 9, verse 24. This is the most amazing prophecy. And if you wonder where dispensationalism and prophetic and Hal Lindsey and, and anybody that, you know, that believes biblical prophecy, you know, like Dallas Seminary and Walvert and John MacArthur, anybody like that, this is where they get it from. And what I'm going to show you in, Ma in Daniel 9, 24 is... How God, look at this, God connects the Roman Empire that was, that was in the time of Christ, in the past, to the Roman Empire that's coming in the future. Now you say, who thought that? Hal Lindsey? Mm -mm. This is what Jesus talks about. 
And, and the way we see that is right here. Look at Daniel 9, 24. First thing to learn, God is very clear. Remember I told you the big box with 1,200 pieces it gets confusing. The Lord just has three numbers for us this morning. Here's the first one, 70. God says everything, everything about the future is 70 weeks. This word, this Hebrew word, is actually the word for a seven, and it's actually what we would call a heptad. Now, you, you think in terms like this, only we have dozens. Those are twelves. Or we like tens, you know. We like our, our numeric system, inches are dozens, but, but all other numbers we like in tens, and, and that's how we do our math. The Jewish mind, God communicates in sevens. You said he does? Yeah. Seven fat cows, seven skinny cows, seven lean years, seven fat years. Remember all the stuff with Joseph's dream. Then we get to the, the descriptions of the Jewish calendar. They had seven days in the week. And when you had seven or six years, the seventh year was a Sabbath year. And, and all of this calendar of Israel, including the Jubilee year and everything else, was all heptatic. That's in sevens. So, think about what this says. 70 weeks. 70 weeks. So, 52 weeks are in a year. So, you have 70. And so, you have approximately 18 weeks left. That's an 18. It won't do it. There we go. Well, it is kind of an 18. So, we're talking about one year and a third of a year. Okay? Let's see if that works. One year and a third of a year are determined for your people. That's the Jews. And for your holy city, that's Jerusalem. Remember, who is he talking to? He's talking to Daniel. Daniel's people were the Jews. His holy city that he turned and opened his window to was Jerusalem. So we're talking about the Jews in Jerusalem. And it says, 70 weeks are determined to do all this stuff. And he continues and he says, Know therefore from the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, that's Jesus Christ, will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Back to our simple numbers. I told you there's only four of them. 70 weeks, and he says, will be seven and 62. Now, does 70 equal seven plus 62? Yes or no? What's missing? Okay, now let me show you. Because right there is why Calvary Bible Church is a dispensational church, which means we believe what the Bible says. Look at this. From the command to restore and build Jerusalem. What is that? That's Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. That is when Artaxerxes allowed Nehemiah, his cupbearer, to go back and rebuild the walls and make Jerusalem a sovereign place with rules, I mean with gates and walls and someone that's governing it living inside. It hadn't been that way. But that command actually happened, if you, you can even look it up on, you know, the, the uh, most unreliable source of all, Wikipedia, and it'll tell you that it's 445 or 444 BC. And like a broken clock, it's right twice a day, you know. And, and so that occurred in 445 BC. Until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So, God says there are 70-somethings. Well, 445 B.C., when, did, when was Jesus crucified? Well, either, depending on, you know, if you listen to Chuck Swindoll or Dallas Seminary or John MacArthur or whoever, it's somewhere between 30 and 33 A.D. And that's because of the lunar, you know, Passover, it's, it's a lunar calendar, and to have Friday be the day he's crucified, you have to look for when that would be. And because of that, 30 or 33 AD is the common conservative view. 445 BC, so you have 445 years, you get 30 more. Wow. That's not... That's, that means that these weeks are not weeks of days or weeks of weeks. They're years. Heptads are years. So what it's saying is God has, back up here, whoop, right there it is. God says, I have 70 weeks. I have 490 years, 490 years planned 
until the world ends. Now, do you see where everybody, you know, gets all these wild, zany ideas? Watch what happens. He says, there is a command, and until Messiah the Prince, Jesus, something happens to him, seven weeks and 62 weeks. That takes us, seven and 62 is only 69 weeks, or uh, the 483 years. And did you know what? If you calculate in, it's 475, but we operate on the Gregorian calendar, and we have to realize that they had first a solar calendar, then they had the Julian calendar, then they went to the Gregorian calendar. And if you want to take the time and look at a good study Bible, you'll find that it exactly comes down not just to the year, but from this command until Christ marched into town on Palm Sunday is exactly 173,880 days, which is exactly 490, 360-day years. But that doesn't matter. We've covered that many times on Sunday night. What's missing still? One. Now watch what the rest of this says. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. So if you had the other verse, it's 7 and 62. So after 69 weeks, 483 years, Messiah will be cut off. What's that? It's the crucifixion. Now look at this. This is what we're getting to Jesus' quote. Not for himself. Jesus was a substitute. And the people of the prince who is to come, uh uh-oh, anybody can figure this out. The people that destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, who was that in AD 70? Who killed 1.1 million Jews? And who leveled the city of Jerusalem? And who quelled the Jewish revolt? Rome. So when it says the people, it's Rome. The Roman Empire. That's the people who destroyed the city and the sanctuary after Jesus was crucified. Jesus was crucified in 30 AD, and 40 years later, in 70 AD, the Romans came and said, enough is enough, Jews, and deported anybody that survived, but killed a million one, 100,000. Wow. But notice what it says. This is the Antichrist. This is the one who is the worst human that will ever live. He is the prince of the people who destroyed the city and the sanctuary. Now, look what Jesus says about him. Then he, who is the he? Here, he's called the prince that will come. If we had enough time and I took you through chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 11, he's called a lot of other names. He's called the little horn. He's called the one with the fierce countenance. He is called the, the uh, abomination that makes desolate. Do you remember when we looked in Matthew 24? Jesus said, when you see this, this abomination that causes desolation in the temple, what temple would he be in? Well, look what happens. He the Antichrist, or the beast of chapter 13 of Revelation, he confirms a covenant with many. How many? Well, how many Muslims are there? 1.2 billion. How many Jews are there? 7 million. This man, not only is the, the Antichrist, not only the worst human that ever lived, he's also the smartest and most clever. And you know what he gets? He gets the 1.2 billion Muslims to shake hands with Israel. And they say, you can build that temple you always wanted up there in Jerusalem. You can build it. Not just that. He allows them to sacrifice and offer to God. Do you want to know what would cause World War III today? If you got the Jews up by the Dome of the Rock, slitting some lamb's throat and burning it, all Muslim hell would break loose for that. This man, he makes a peace covenant with Israel and the world. How does he make it? He is the prince who is to come of the Roman. This is where, if you've ever heard of the revived Roman Empire, the the dispensationalists didn't think of it. God says it. But what is it? Well, there are 70 weeks 
seven of them are gone, 62 of them are gone, you already did the math, one of them is left, a week of years is seven years. How long is the tribulation? Say it out loud. Seven years. Look what it says here. It says, in the middle of the week. What is that? That's why, if you read the book of Revelation, it says 42 months. What's 42 months? 42 months is three and a half years. What is that? It's 1,260 days. What is that? It's from the middle to the end of seven years. What is the seven years? It's the 70 weeks God has planned for his people minus the 69 that are already accomplished that ended at the cross, meaning there's one week of human history, seven years left on the clock. But it's an indeterminate time between the cross in AD 30 and today, the Lord has allowed us in the church to thrive to go to every kingdom and tongue and tribe and nation and share the gospel. But there's a moment coming when God is going to call back every demon that's out in the universe and the devil himself and confine all of them to planet Earth. That period of time is one week or seven years long. And for the first three and a half, this guy is doing this. He's making everybody happy. He's using the NSA records and you got to worship or whatever he uses, you know, to, to make sure no one can buy or sell. And he's putting himself up as the global peacemaker. He gets the Jews sacrificing in Jerusalem, but he breaks his word in the middle and turns on the Jews. And that is the seven-year tribulation, the second half, which is horrific, which culminates with the abomination which makes desolation. You say, so what? Well, it's time to go. This is the man Jesus affirmed, Matthew 24, 15. He calls him the abomination of desolation. Paul talks about him. He was the one, he says, I told you already about him, Paul taught from Daniel. John said in 1 John 2, he says, you've already heard about the Antichrist. He taught them what the scriptures say. If you live so long and if I live so long and we get to Revelation chapter 12, do you know what the whole chapter is about? six chapters from now, that the key to understanding everything that's going on is God said, I have picked Israel and placed my name on them and they are going to be there to receive me at the second coming. God already wrote in Zechariah 12 through 14 that the Jews are going to be like this, saying, Messiah, save us. Satan says, whoa, if I can get rid of them, then God's word will not come true, and I won. So all of human history, the devil has been trying to get rid of Israel from the beginning. He started in Genesis 6 by demonizing, and so God flooded the whole earth. So he says, okay, I'm going to kill all the firstborn in Egypt. That's Exodus 1. That didn't work. So he said, and he waited a little while, and he says, ah, here is the ultimate Israelite, Jesus Christ. I'm going to kill him as a baby. That didn't work. So he comes and tempts him and says, hey, you don't have to do anything but bow to me. And Jesus said, no. So what does he do after that? He tries to drown him when he's in a fishing boat, sleeping. And that didn't work. And so he gets a whole group of people in Luke 4 to try and push him over the cliff edge in Nazareth. And Jesus disappeared. So he gets the gang together in John 8 and other places. And they pick up stones to stone Jesus. But he disappears again. So Satan finally enters Judas enters him and makes Judas betray Christ. And, and Satan was so excited, he watched and he was holding his breath and it made it and they nailed him and he died. And he went, ah, the king of Israel, I got him. And then, right, Paul said Satan would not have crucified Christ. He would not have been behind the religious leaders inciting them if he would have known the plan. See, he doesn't understand the Bible. He led up to the glorious resurrection by having Christ crucified. Well, last thing before we go. The ultimate peacemaker is the beast. Revelation 13 says you can't buy or sell unless you have his signature on your life. 666, 666. You say, well, we're not going to be here. No, we're not. But you know what we're supposed to have instead? Instead of being 
fearful that Satan's going to get us with a 666, God says, no one that has my signature on their life will ever die. They have eternal life. What is God's signature? He regenerates us. Only God can change my heart, Ezekiel 36 says. You know, Monday night I was speaking at, at a retirement center and, and this 93-year-old Alice was there and she was sitting at the back, couldn't quite hear me and so her friends brought her up and she said, on her walker, she came up and she said, sir? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I was in the back and I, I thought you said that all of your sins were forgiven. She said, I know that's impossible. I've been a Catholic 93 years and mine aren't, so yours couldn't be. So she said, what did you really say? <laughs> what was she asking for? the gospel. And I told her that when God regenerated me, he gave me a new heart, he converted me, changed my whole life, I called out to him and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I repented. That doesn't mean I'm perfect. That doesn't mean I don't sin. It means he changed my mind about sin. Sin is horrible to be avoided. And when that happens, he adopted me into his family. He began the process of sanctifying me, and instantaneously, all of my sins were put on Christ. So this sweet 93-year-old woman looked me in the eye and she said, I heard you say it again. She said, I'm mistaken. Tell me what you're trying to tell me. And I said, here, let your friends. And I, her friends were in their 80s, youngsters over there. And uh, I said, I pointed the first one. I said, where are your sins? And I was just praying that she knew the right answer. And she looked at the 93-year-old and said, all of my sins were nailed to the cross with Jesus. I said, good. And I looked at the next one. I said, where are yours? And she says, my sins are as far as the east is from the west. So far as he, well, they were studying the Bible. They knew justification. Then the signature of God adopted into his family, sanctified. By the way, this is the reason we gather, to be sanctified by the word of God. But this is our goal. Someday God is going to change where I am. He's going to take me home to be with him. The question this morning is, have you been signed by God? Have you been born again? And if you haven't been, maybe that's the whole reason why the Lord brought you here this morning. Let's all stand for a word of prayer. As you're standing, at every service we close with a word of prayer. And while I pray, the elders and the Titus two women, our godly women of the faith, come and they all serve on duty up here. And if you want to talk to someone, like Alice came to me on Monday night and said, I, you said it so fast, could you explain it to me? If you want someone to explain to you the scriptures, how you can be sure you're saved, or how to get started back walking with the Lord, they'd love to pray with you. And if you're new and never been, I'm headed across the hallway to the Fellowship Center. I'd love to meet you. But this is God's plan. Four empires, the signature of God on all who will repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and let him save them. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for letting us gather. Thank you for your word that's forever settled in heaven. Thank you that you have one week left of prophetic history. And it kicks off when the worst human ever to live starts the peace process with your chosen people of promise and deceives them into thinking that he's the Messiah they always heard about. And what a horrible time the world will go through. But we who know you, you're going to prepare a place for us and you return and take us to that place. That's our blessed hope. But thank you for telling us the future. We feel it's so close. May we live for your coming and finding us doing what you left us to do. In the precious name of Jesus we pray and all of God's people said, amen and God bless you as you go.